Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're having a great week. My own has been delightful in part because I've been able to reread The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Just an absolutely a roaring adventure, scientific romance, um, and kind of a terrifying book, uh, but one that I, I dearly love. Um, H.G. Wells was probably my, my favorite writer between the ages of about 8 to 10. Uh, I read all of his major science fiction books. I reread them, uh, and I've kind of been returning to them over the years. I believe with this reading, this book goes into the uh, read in every decade of my life category, which is just a great place to be. And um, th there's something about this book, the, the way in which it's it's an early example of using setting the, the story in the future rather than in the past or in, you know, some vague year, the way that the Russian novelists and a number of Victorian writers would do. Um, but it sets it in the future, and from there it begins to just unpeel different things around what Wells is predicting about society, not just for technology. He's not that interested in predicting too much around human technology. He wants to speculate on Martian technology, but he's not super interested in human technology. He's interested in human society, and I think that's the hallmark of really great science fiction, is it's not so much about what's going to happen, you know, in terms of like, whoa, we'll be, will we be able to travel here? Or will we be able to do this thing? Or will we have, you know, uh, created some new weapon of war? It's rather, what do all of those things reveal about new human societies? How do they affect human societies? And that's where Wells, like, real, you know, passion was, um, especially as his later writings reveal. So this is a great book. If you've never read it, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and it, it, it begins in such a... Uh, calm and ultimately terrifying tone. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that this world was being watched keenly and closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro over this globe about their little affairs, serene in their assurance of their empire over matter. It is possible that the infusoria under the microscope do the same. No one gave a thought to the older worlds of space as sources of human danger, or thought of them only to dismiss the idea of life upon them as impossible or improbable. It goes on. Yet across the gulf of space, Minds that are to our minds as ours are to those of the beasts that perish, intellects vast and cool and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. And early in the 20th century came the great disillusionment. I mean, it's just a beautiful opening. Uh, it has this, this sense of foreboding. You know, there's science present comparisons to, you know, humans to bacteria, Mass at like Chekhov's microscope there on that one, by the way. <laughs> but humans to bacteria, and then you know, telescoping from there to humans to the Martians, and um, and one it's it's astonishing how so many of our ideas around alien life, and the fears that uh, that fiction writers will use to and conjure up around alien life can in, in some ways be traced to the malevolence of the Martians, the clinical malevolence of the Martians in the War of the Worlds. Uh, the ways in which they are not they are not our friends, they're here to conquer, and they're going to treat us like, you know, cattle or, or, or uh, you know, oxen um, to be fattened up is, is just kind of terrifying. I remember reading it as a child and, and, and legitimately being terrified of the Martians. <laughs> and, and and from it by extension like any idea of alien life just being this horrifying idea um, and and within it, it it's important to note the book is totally driven by plot and speculation and by this this sense of um, personality that our narrator has nobody else within the book really feels like a character even the narrator's brother who has a, a fairly like heroic man of action scene you know trying to like stave off uh, a couple of men who are gonna attack uh, some women and fi finding a way, you know, to escape uh, on, on a boat away from the Martian uh, tripods. I mean, he doesn't really have a personality. Um, our, our, our really only sense of, of a true human character is the narrator and we're with him for most of the book, most of this tale. Uh, and yet, even with, even with that absence of, of many human characters to hang on to and anchor on to, 
the book generates such a narrative power that we're carried along by that, that intensity. Um, and Wells does another thing very well. He, he presents just enough of a glimpse of the Martians or just enough of the technology to keep us moving forward. Um, he does ultimately describe in quite a bit of detail the Martians and what they look like um, and different aspects of their anatomy. He describes the, uh, some of the various devices they come up with, the famous tripods that walk along, the uh, weird hand carts they use, <laughs> um, the ways in which they feed. That's quite gross. But he always does it with, with you know, pulling back just enough of the curtain. Uh, and some, that's something he did in a number of his other works quite well. As an example, after the glimpse I'd had of the Martians emerging from the cylinder in which they'd come to the Earth from their planet, a kind of fascination paralyzed my actions. I remained standing knee-deep in the heather, staring at the mound that hid them. I was a battleground of fear, fear and curiosity. I did not dare to go back towards the pit, but I felt a passionate longing to peer into it. I began walking, therefore, in a big curve seeking some point of vantage and continually looking at the sand heaps that hid these newcomers to our earth. Once, a leash of thin black whips, like the arms of an octopus, flashed across the sunset and was immediately withdrawn. And afterwards, a thin rod rose up joint by joint, bearing at its apex a circular disk that spun with a wobbling motion. What could be going on there? And it goes on in that same chapter. Suddenly there was a flash of light and a quantity of luminous greenish smoke came out of the pit in three distinct puffs which drove up one after the other straight into the still air. This smoke, or flame perhaps, would be the better word for it, was so bright that the deep blue sky overhead and the hazy stretches of brown common towards Chertsey set with black pine trees seemed to darken abruptly as these puffs arose and to remain the darker after their dispersal. At the same time, a faint hissing sound became audible. And so we're told these little things, these little pieces, the octopus arm, this rod rising up in the circular disc spinning, uh, green smoke and, and hissing. So we have all these little like details, but we rarely get a whole picture um, until we're so wrapped in that and we see the destruction on humans and on you know the, the buildings and the villages, that's when we start to get more in-depth discussions uh, you know, and, and descriptions of what's going on. Uh, I don't want to, I mean, I assume many people have read the story or sort of know the ending, but it really is a fantastic book and, and a, a book that I think points in so many uh, avenues for future fiction uh, while drawing on some fascinating influences. It's interesting that um, the, the, sort, the other character who seems to be present quite a bit is, is stuck with our narrator for a while is a curate, a uh, minister, who vacillates between like massive indecision around what this means for the church and what this means for religion and why did they build these Sunday schools if these things were going to happen and then this like fatalistic acceptance of of you know the Martian invasion um, and the Martian you know subjugation of humans uh, and sort of like just embraces that and falls apart and so it seems to have had this implied like criticism uh, yet you know of religion yet Wells narrator fascinatingly goes to church uh, even, you know, in some of the most desperate times, he re re records himself as praying and even uh, questioning, you know, from this really strange idea of do the Martians also pray to, you know, and do they, if so, do they pray to the same God? And, and wanting to take that and internalize the fear and the humility that he feels in this moment um, and sort of recognizing if, if the Martians can do this to me, what am I doing to everything else that is alive here on Earth? And so it creates this very uh, poignant sense um, alongside, you know, that curate character <laughs> uh, as, um, as, as an implied criticism. And so it's really fascinating to see that and, and to um, kind of consider that. Uh, but the book is just absolute dynamite and highly, highly recommended. If you've not read it, Penguin Classics came out with some great volumes. I also have their... Uh, invisible Man, which this this one really fascinated me. I wanted to become an Invisible Man, not go, you know, uh, become deranged and dangerous, but I thought that was really cool when I was a kid, too. Um, that said, one of the more recent, uh, my, my most recent rereading of The World of Worlds was stimulated um, uh, in my 20s when I was reading The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Volume 2, which takes the War of the Worlds for a little ride. Um, and so this might be a, a fun 
um, book, uh, comic book, graphic novel, if you've never read it, if you enjoy The War of the Worlds. Of course, uh, possibly my favorite H.G. Wells is still The Time Machine, and it's interesting to look at how, the, from The Time Machine to uh, War of the Worlds, the ways in which, um, particularly through the artilleryman character in War of the Worlds, Wells uh, and t takes his ideas around what human society's future could be in the time machine where we have the uh, the Eloy and the Morlocks, and he almost says, well, this, you know, this Martian invasion, there could be people who live underground and try to, like, stick it out and become a resistance and are the tough, independent, like, you know, folks, and then the people who will just give in to the Martian subjugation and be treated like cattle, much like the dynamic we see in the time machine. And I reread this last October, absolutely loved it. Um, I'll link that video in the description box. And Wells, of course, uh, is, is sort of uh, one of the godfathers of steampunk, along with the great Jules Verne. And K.W. Jeter's Morlock Knight is an unofficial sequel to The Time Machine and one of the greats of, of steampunk. Um, but uh, another one would be James P. Blaylock's Homunculus. Um, although Lord Kelvin's Machine and the Aylesford Skull are probably even slightly better than the Homunculus. And Wells also helps stimulate that great uh, passion in science fiction for Mars and life on Mars, particularly pre, uh, uh, pre-1960s when we got satellite images that, and um, uh, the, uh, the satellites that had actually been able to land on Mars and send transmissions back saying, nothing's alive there. <laughs> Um, but the Martian Chronicles from Ray Bradbury is, of course, a hallmark of the old Mars uh, stories. That sense of malevolent alien um, is, is, is very critical to the cosmic horror that comes along about a generation after H.G. Wells was writing The War of the Worlds. So writers like H.P. Lovecraft in works as diverse as uh, The Color from Out of, Out of Space, uh, but even in... in um, Oh, what is it? The Whisperer in the Darkness and others, where there's this sense of alien life that either doesn't care about humans or alien life that is pretty much here to just subjugate humans and, you know, take resources or whatever they need. Um, that feels very, very much influenced by the, the idea of the Martians from H.G. Wells. Um, writers as diverse as Richard Matheson, I think, tap into some of that horror as well quite effectively. Um, the, uh, the other one that jumps to mind is the fascinating way in which the middle of the book, um, sort of the second half of book one after the Martians have invaded and our, our uh, narrator is trying to kind of escape in his journey, the ways in, and his brother's journey in particular, the ways in which that um, seems to have influenced, in my reading at least, a lot of uh, spy fiction. So works like from Alan First, the Polish officer, when characters are trying to escape and run away and, 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 and the, the harrowing adventures they have, uh, Wells, while writing this adventure science fiction book, seems to anticipate some of the ways in which spy fiction will do that. And of course, the great idea of like um, English resistance in the face of you know absolute mayhem and horror called to mind uh, my recent reading of Rogue Mail by Jeffrey Household. Um, the other uh, hilarious influence <laughs> was, uh, I've been reading Three Men on a Boat uh, by Jerome K. Jerome with uh, Mark from Book Time with Elvis and a whole bunch of people. And the river, uh, the journey up the river kind of goes through some of the same countryside <laughs> as the Martians storm through in the War of the Worlds. Um, the weird nonfiction influences I, I thought, uh, the ways in which Wells traps his narrator in a kitchen to like peer out and see little pieces of the Martians and what's going on. Reminded me, of course, of uh, Plato's allegory of the cave. And it, he's explicitly identified in some ways. Um, the ideas around natural selection uh, and evolution that Darwin um, had pushed in Origin of the Species and other works uh, feels very much something that Wells is, is taking in mind and using and exploring in the War of the Worlds. So let me know if you've read it. Let me know if you uh, enjoy other works from Wells. Uh, I'm a, as I said, I'm a huge fan. I enjoy the adaptations, the the radio plays, the various uh, film adaptations. We rewatched the '50s one this week, and I once played um, sections from the radio one for a summer school English class I was uh, helping out with many, many about ten years ago. So it's a it's one I enjoy revisiting, and I do hope everybody's doing well. Thanks.